Hello, welcome to our webinar today about emerging technologies in impact assessment. My name is Bridget John and I'll be your moderator. Today's webinar is hosted by the International Association for Impact Assessment, or IAIA. We are the leading global network on best practice for using impact assessment to make informed decisions. Today's presentation is part of a webinar program we initiated last year. And I invite you to visit our website to check out the recordings of a few of our recent webinars. You'll see that we have webinars on biodiversity, indigenous voices, psychosocial impact assessment, health, resettlement, a variety of webinars there and many, many more. So please visit our website. It's listed there on the screen uh, and check out some of our recordings and the slides and handouts that went with it. If you would like to share on social media anything that you hear today, you'll see our Twitter handle there and the hashtag IAIA webinar. A few pieces of housekeeping before we get started. We will indeed be recording our webinar today and you will receive a link to it after the a day or two after the webinar is over. If you have questions along the way, please feel free to put them in the questions box that is on the control panel on the right side of your screen most likely. Um, so type those in at any time throughout the webinar and I will be monitoring those and pose those to Marla at the end. We are also making the slides available so you can access those in the handouts bar also in your control panel and they will be made available to you afterwards as well when you get the link to the recording. So our presenter today is Marla Orenstein. Marla is someone a lot of you may know. She was the president of IAIA in 2017 and 2018, and she's still on the board of directors. We're lucky to have her. She's been uh, a lot of energy and ideas and enthusiasm and was behind our more recent uh, membership survey that provided a lot of information about IAIA and feedback, as well as information about in the field of impact assessment in general. So Marla has spent many years doing health impact assessment and also has a strong interest in how new technologies are applied in business. She lives in Canada and she currently works as the director of the Natural Resources Policy Center at the Canada West Foundation, which is a public policy think tank. And now I'll turn it over to Marla. Thank you so much, Bridget. And thank you everyone for joining me at whatever time of day it is for you. Uh, it's still pretty early in the morning here. It's just starting to get light, so excuse me if it sounds like I need some coffee still. This webinar comes out of a bunch of research that I've done over the past two years. So personally, I have two very different, indeed opposing visions and opinions about new technologies. On the one hand, I love science fiction. I love thinking about how society could look in the future and how it might be different and what role technology will play within that. And like many of you, I find new devices really fun to play with. And at the same time, I have a sort of a phobia about new technologies. I think most of them don't live up to the hype. And I think there's a lot of unintended consequences that we haven't really faced yet. So starting about two years ago, I thought I'd go on a bit of a fact-finding mission. I did a lot of reading about how new technologies were developing and how they were being used in other professions. And I also interviewed about 15 people who work in various aspects of emerging technologies to see what they thought about current trends and what the future might hold. So this webinar comes out of that research. If you're interested, I also wrote a series of three articles on the topic that are posted on my LinkedIn page, and you're welcome to, to scroll to and read those. And so now let's get down to it. Emerging technologies and impact assessment, the topic we're all here to talk about. So in my opinion, the way in which impact assessment is conducted has not fundamentally changed since it started in the 1960s. Some techniques have improved, and certainly reports have grown larger, but impact assessment has remained relatively static in terms of its approach to data gathering, stakeholder engagement, analysis, and reporting. At the same time, we're witnessing an increasing number of professions being substantially changed by the application of emerging technologies, for example, medicine, law, genomics, astronomy, architecture in each of these new areas in each of these areas new technologies are being harnessed to ex extract dramatic improvements from systems that require substantial human effort i think impact assessment should be next on this list 
there's a lot of new value to be created if we can identify how to exploit new technologies to refine our predictions, to improve our communication, and to expand our reach. So I'm going to talk first about different kinds of emerging technologies and how they could be used. There's lots of exciting things that comprise emerging technologies, and you've likely heard the names of most of them. For example, there's artificial intelligence and machine learning, there's robotics, nanotechnologies, biotechnologies, augmented reality, 3D printing, and many, many more. And if you listen to TED Talks, as I do, I'm sure you'll be familiar with most of them. So I want to start off today's talk by speaking about several of these emerging technologies, what they are exactly, and how they could be applied to impact assessment. The first technology I want to talk about is data visualization. So here's one of the problems we have in IA uh, that is, to me, very well represented by this photo. Over the last 30 years, the reports that we're producing in impact assessment have grown increasingly large. I recently worked on a project for which the completed report was over 19,000 pages long. That's two meters worth of binders. And this is not unusual. However, the only way in which the communication of IA content has modernized is that the reports are now available as PDFs that can be downloaded. This is an area where impact assessment really needs to evolve in order to stay relevant and helpful to the different stakeholder groups who are supposed to derive benefit from our work. Perhaps instead of very large reports, we can find other and better ways of conveying information. I don't just mean pretty graphs and charts. Here's the holodeck from Star Trek. This would be a great way to help people understand how a project might change their environment. And sure, we don't have a holodeck invented yet, but we're getting there, aren't we? So let's think about the future, not through incremental improvement, but where do we really want to arrive at? Now I'm going to talk about a second emerging technology, remote sensing. Remote sensing itself is nothing new. We've had plain old photography for well over 150 years. And since then, all sorts of new remote sensing technologies have come in to help us see what can't be observed with the naked eye. For example, there's radar or LIDAR to measure distance. There's thermal imaging to measure temperature. There's radiation sensors that measure, measure radiation and, and lots of other types as well. Remote sensing is already used a lot in impact assessment because it helps us measure and monitor all kinds of useful things. It can be used for soil surveys, mineral exploration, mapping terrain, monitoring water resources, mapping vegetation types, monitoring wildlife. There's lots and lots of different applications that are of use to people doing impact assessment. So what's different now? In my mind, it isn't so much the types of remote sensing themselves, but the delivery mechanisms, specifically drones and satellites. So first we've got drone technology. Drones themselves are getting better. They're able to fly longer distances, endure harsher conditions, and better carry cameras and other sensors. Drones are exciting because they let us get to places we couldn't otherwise go. For example, we can use drones to access pristine areas that we don't want to disturb with vehicles or people. And drones are also really great for reaching places that are too difficult to access otherwise such as areas that have experienced a disaster or where the terrain is too difficult or whether the, where the weather or environment is too extreme. And we also have satellites. Satellites are a great way to view large-scale changes and changes over time. What's changed about this now is who has access to it. The bar to access has dropped tremendously. It used to be that sensing and mapping technologies were really cumbersome and really expensive and really difficult to learn. Now they're incredibly cheap or even free and easy to use. So I can just pull it up and say, look, here's where I am now. A third technology I wanna talk about is blockchain. Um, blockchain's something you've probably heard about and mostly in the context of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ethereum. I found that a lot of times Blockchain is described in a really confusing way so that even at the end of the explanation, I have no idea what was just said, but actually it's really not that complicated. Blockchain technology is just an electronic transaction. It's a contract. It's a way for two parties, like a buyer and a seller, for example, to exchange something. 
It can be used to exchange monetary value, and that's what happens with Bitcoin, or it can be used to execute a different kind of contract, like a business contract, for example. What's new and different about it is two things. First, it's fully automatic, so that transactions can happen without human hands on the process. We've had contracts for a long time. For example, you could always get a lawyer or a government office to execute a contract, but not needing a person in the middle does a few things. First, it makes the transaction happen instantly, so you don't need to wait for the government office to open on Monday morning. It also means that nobody can just make off with the money and cheat the other party. So that's one thing about blockchain. It's fully automatic with no middleman. The second thing about blockchain is that it leaves a permanent record of every transaction. This is the chain part of the blockchain. Every time a transaction takes place, another block or record gets added on, creating a long chain of recorded transactions. The photo here of the child adding another block onto this tower is a really good way to think about it. Every time there's a new transaction, a new block gets added to the tower or chain, but that block can never be removed. It's permanently attached. And another important point is that the record can't be falsified because it isn't just in one place. It's recorded on a lot of different computers in a lot of different places. And, and we refer to this as, as this being a distributed ledger. Anytime there's a transaction, all the computers check with each other to make sure the record looks the same in all places. And if it isn't, that's when you can identify that something false is going on. So that's what blockchain is. It's a way of executing a contract automatically and without cheating. It's a set of rules evaluated by an automated system where all the parties agree to a common rule set. It can be used to exchange money or to execute any other kind of contract. Oops. How will it be used in impact assessment? Uh, frankly, I have no idea. There's a lot of talk about smart contracts founded on blockchain, but I have no idea whether they'll be useful to us in impact assessment. Um, maybe they will. For example, maybe they will start to be used to help all parties execute impact benefit agreements. Your guess is as good as mine. However, I do note that there's one person who registered for this webinar who noted that they're using blockchain for food chain security. So that's a really interesting application that I hadn't thought of. The next technology I'm going to talk about is artificial intelligence and machine learning. So let's start with an explanation of what this means exactly. At a basic level, artificial intelligence, or AI, means using computers to simulate human decision making. This started a couple of decades ago with what is called good old-fashioned artificial intelligence, or GOFAI. And in good old-fashioned artificial intelligence, expert-derived rules, which are, were if-then statements, which you, you may remember if you ever had to, to do a very basic programming course, these are programmed into the computer, which applies these rules to optimize certain outcomes. So this can be used, for example, for situations in which there are clear decisions to be made based on limited inputs and a limited set of really easily described rules. So it's really good for winning a game of tic-tac-toe, for example, or for smart home technology, or any sort of thing where you can envision in advance what sorts of decisions might need to be made, and then you can program the computer to respond accordingly. What it is not so good at is more complex or fuzzy situations like trying to identify whether a, a certain photo is a cat or a vacuum cleaner or powering self-driving cars. So this brings us to machine learning. Machine learning is considered the cutting edge of artificial intelligence right now. In machine learning, rather than giving the computer a specific set of rules, we give it a large amount of data and then we turn the computer loose so it can figure out the best way to reach a particular goal. And along the way, the computer makes predictions and then refines its approach based on the success of those predictions. So there's three features that are key about machine learning. First, the computer decides for itself what features of the data are relevant or important. So we're not saying a cat must have eyes, or you have to look for a tail, or a vacuum cleaner must have a nozzle. Instead, the computer's making its own choices about what's important. And most of the time, we have no idea what that choice is. And often, frankly, it's something that we as humans wouldn't have noticed or wouldn't have chosen. 
A, a second feature of machine learning is that the answers that come back are not absolute truths, but instead they're probabilistic outputs. So what you get is this is 90% a chance that it's a picture of a cat and 10% chance that it's a vacuum cleaner. And third, the computer can learn and improve. And this is where big data comes in. In order to learn and improve, the computer needs lots and lots and lots of examples to work with so it can refine its predictive process. All this helps it go from cat 60%, vacuum cleaner 40%, to cat 99%, vacuum cleaner 1%. If the data set is too small, there just aren't enough examples to learn from. So machine learning and big data go hand in hand. You need big data for machine learning to work. But also, if you're not doing machine learning, there's really no benefit in having a, a really big data set to work with. Finally, I want to mention deep learning or cognitive computing, since these approaches are on the rise. In the same way that machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, deep learning is a subset of machine learning. Deep learning relies on artificial neural networks that mimic the interconnected structures of the human brain to enable high-level abstraction. Deep learning has led to computers being able to analyze patterns in very human-like ways. So for example, recognizing not just faces, but particular individuals' faces. So this one's Mark Zuckerberg's face. This one is Bridget John's face. Or understanding how language is used naturally. So a lot of what powers the success behind Siri on the iPhone or Google Translate is deep learning. So now this brings me to AI and impact assessment, or as I'm starting to call it, artificial intelligence assisted impact assessment, or AIAIA, as though we don't already have enough acronyms. Um, and I'm going to talk for the, the next little bit about what I think is the best use of artificial intelligence in impact assessment right now. And when I think about all the things that we do in impact assessment, there are really three parts of it that I think are most amenable at this point in time to using artificial intelligence and harnessing that, that extra mind power. And these are scoping, baseline data collect, collect, compilation, and analysis. So in scoping, we pick through details about the project, details about the environment and the social context, uh, details about st stakeholders' concerns, and about similar things that have occurred in the past. And we try to identify what issues or what value components are the most important to include in a given impact assessment. This type of data synthesis is really well suited for computer enhancement because computers are better than people at sifting through large masses of data to pick out patterns and to apply evaluation criteria consistently. I know uh, I had a colleague who said, I do it differently before lunch and after lunch. And uh, that's probably true for all of us, that at the beginning of the day and the end of the day, um, the way that you look at data may not be quite consistent, but if we turn a, a artificial intelligence loose to do it, it's going to do it the same way every single time. So my verdict here is that artificial intelligence is a relatively easy win for using artifi um, artificial intelligence in IA. And I may have said artificial intelligence, but I mean scoping. Scoping is a relatively easy win. Um, it's likely to enable better scoping through the inclusion of more information and through a more rigorous and transparent process of selecting value components. And going back to the presentation, baseline data compilation is a really good fit for AI in my mind. This is one of the areas that AI is currently being widely used in other professions to assemble information from a lot of different sources. For example, in law, in the legal profession, AI is increasingly being used for trawling through large numbers of documents during the legal discovery process to identify where relevant information exists and to assemble that information into a single useful package. What's helpful now is that AI can deal both with structured and unstructured data. So structured data is, is the type of data set that you may have seen in an Excel file, where there are rows with information or columns with information, but that each one is labeled so that you know what type of data it is. So that this has to do with people's names, and this one is their address, and this one is their age, and this one is their blood type, and this one is whether they have a pet or not. Um, and something that tells the computer what the meaning of each of those data pieces is going to be, that's structured data. Unstructured data is just any sort of text that you throw at the computer 
where um, you haven't told it what the content is or how it's organized. The ability for computers and artificial intelligence to deal with unstructured data is new. It only used to be structured data. And this opens up a lot more information that can be fed into the process. If you can just throw in any types of reports or other bits of information without having to first go through and, and break down what's in there. So artificial intelligence can help in the grunt work that it takes to compile baseline information. And perhaps the data can be presented in a much finer grain, for example, community by community, if we can leverage our increased capacity to identify, sift through, organize, and present it in a way that's user-friendly. So what does a human do in this equation? Where a human can provide value is through interpretation of the data, describing the meaning of what's been observed. Sadly, in my opinion, interpretation of baseline data is often skipped in many impact assessments. Instead, the data is just presented as is with the reader left to infer the meaning and the importance. With AI-assisted IA, perhaps human time can be freed up to better describe the meaning of the data that we're showing. There's a number of methodologic hurdles that will have to be overcome, including helping computers identify what constitutes good versus bad input, bad meaning unreliable input, and figuring out how to integrate different kinds of knowledge, for example, Western versus indigenous knowledge. However, conceptually, this is a simple area for applying machine learning, and I think it's going to be one of the earliest areas in which AI will be used for IA. So assessment. To be perfectly frank, I think the assessment stage in IA is a bit of a mess. When we do an analysis, making predictions about what is likely to occur as a result of a given project, we usually have a great deal of uncertainty due to a number of factors. First, a lack of sufficient information about the project or the context. Secondly, a lack of evidence-based examples to work from. Or, or third, difficulty in agreeing on what constitutes meaningful change. And as a result, we often have to rely on a professional judgment to make an educated guess about what's likely to occur. Professional judgment for each one of us comes from mere decades of experience and a few dozen projects that we've worked on. Artificial intelligence can, in theory, learn from hundreds or thousands of IAs that have been conducted across a wide range of conditions. When I go on vacation or for a work trip, I choose a hotel after looking at probably five or six reviews for each of maybe a dozen hotels. Would my decisions be better if I had looked at thousands of reviews for hundreds of hotels? Certainly, my knowledge would be more nuanced, and there'd be fewer surprises, and greater confidence in the results. And as the outcome of an IA has greater and more lasting importance than my choice of hotels, I am of the opinion that more information informing the process is likely to result in better outcomes. This is an area that's going to take real work, and there's a lot of methodologic challenges to overcome, but it's also the area that I am most excited to see develop. So my verdict on assessment is, again, lots of methodological challenges, but potentially there's a huge value add to, to applying impact assessment for the assessment phase itself. Or it is still early, applying artificial intelligence for the assessment phase. So now I want to talk a little bit about the implications of using artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies for impact assessment. And in my opinion, this is the juicy stuff to talk about. And there's three things I want to, want to talk through. The first is human values and artificial intelligence. Who gets to decide what's best? A second question, will we all be re replaced by computers? And the third, who wins and who loses in this whole proposition? So machine learning is becoming more and more adept at handling uncertainty and holes in data availability, which is great. But what it can't handle is the decision about whose values to calibrate the answer to. This is really, really, really important. I think there are certain preferred outcomes that will be easy for us all to agree on. We want to minimize the impact on biodiversity. We want to maximize local employment. We want to minimize air emissions. We want to identify how the project can support better health outcomes. That's great. But what do we do when we can't satisfy all these conditions at once or for all populations? 
how do we balance the trade-offs that will need to be made? So this brings up the question of who gets to decide? Is it the project proponent? Is it the IA consultant? Is it the regulatory agency? Is it society at large? Um, I have a quote from a guy named Adis, Adam Elkis who wrote in Slate a really great summary of, of the, really the crux of this problem. He said, if only the problem were just how to engineer a system to respect human values, that would make it very easy. The question is not whether machines could be made to obey human values, but which humans ought to decide those values. There is no amount of data-driven algorithms that are going to solve this problem. And that's the end of the quote. This is a huge debate with respect to emerging technologies and one that I think that we as a profession need to keep in the front of our minds as we move forward. Question two, will artificial intelligence replace us, leaving us all jobless? I don't think so for two reasons. First, I think AIAIA is a situation in which the power of human and machine cognition working together performs better than either one working alone. Right now, the best chess player in the world isn't a person and it isn't a computer. It's a hybrid team of a person and a computer working in tandem, which performs either better than either one working solo. I think that IA may also represent a situation in which a human-machine team produces superior performance. The machine provides the mind power to catalog and analyze hundreds of thousands of data points. And the human provides the values check to ensure that the unique project and community context is sufficiently considered and that the results align with what our society desires as an outcome. Second, the work of the economist James Besson has found that occupations that use computers grow faster, not slower. So ideally, this means growth for our profession, not a takeover. As a result, uh, or as, as an example, um, he, he provides um, the issue of bank tellers. And back when we had, had banks that didn't have automated tellers, we only had tellers where we had to walk into the banks. When uh, machines started coming in, uh, ATMs, so that you could go and, and do the work of the teller yourself, it was thought that tellers were going to be rendered completely useless. But now, even though automated bank machines are very, very common, um, there's more tellers than there ever were before. Uh, simply because they're now being used in different ways and for different applications. And also many, many more bank branches have been able to be opened because the human workload isn't nearly as much as there were previously. So that being said, we also need to realize that the nature of the work an IA professional undertakes will need to change. There will need to be a new value proposition for human effort within the IA process. And the last point, who wins and who loses? Or how can we make everybody win? What can everybody get out of this? First, communities. Um, this also goes back to the idea of better visual data visualization. Um, it's definitely a win for local stakeholders and other interested people. If IA can be done faster or cheaper or easier, maybe we can do more impact assessments and um, on a wider range of topics and help really inform communities about a wider range of things that are that are going on um, if this can be done more cheaply and easily and if the results can be made more understandable. So I think there's a potential win for communities there. Secondly, the regulators could also have a win for them. It, it's better for them if the impact assessment is more transparent or more rigorous or if there's better presentation or visualization of information. So I think that potentially it could help regulators in that way. For project proponents, there, it's interesting questions. Will it actually reduce costs? Uh, will it provide more bang for the buck? It may not bring the cost down, but maybe it'll bring the information load that they get or the nuance of decision making. Uh, it may increase for them, not quite sure. Um, consulting companies who are at the forefront of developing or adopting emerging technologies as part of the IA process will have an advantage. They'll be perceived as technologically advanced and they may be able to take on more work with greater efficiencies and hence profit built into the system. It may also enable consulting companies to move away from an hourly billing approach to something where they charge for value produced, which can help a company scale up its profits. But what about smaller companies and independent consultants that can't adapt as rapidly and can't afford to purchase 
AI technology. I think the news may not be so bad for these small companies, as technology has been ma being made increasingly affordable, available, and frictionless. We've seen that the, how a lot of different things that used to be expensive, bulky, and requiring specialist knowledge in the past, such as, as GIS, meaning ArcGIS, or, or some other CAD CAM um, programs and specialists to run them, are now things that we can all do on our iPhones. Similarly, we may find that the smaller companies may not have much lag time before they're nipping at the heels of the larger companies, and the more nimble of them may find success actually ahead of the curve. Um, so before we go to questions, two things. First, we're going to launch some sort of something around emerging technologies and impact assessment. So if you're interested in being part of a group that is going to do something on this, learn more, I don't know what it is we're going to be doing yet exactly, um, but drop an email to this email address, iaia.emerging.tech at gmail.com, and just let me know who you are. You could talk about your interests as well, and as we go forward, we'll try to figure out who's interested in doing something, and, um, and we'll work together on that. The second thing is, Bridget reminds me through the chat feature that I blasted right through the fact that I was going to put in a poll um, to find out about um, where you think the value mostly is uh, for you as we go forward. So I'm going to try to turn this back over to Bridget. Um, and All right. There we go. I've, so you should see on your screen a uh, quick poll. Uh, which of these technologies are you most excited about? So there's four options there. So please go ahead and vote. Um, data visualization, remote sensing, blockchain, and artificial intelligence. So Marla had some great information about all four of those, um, both in general, but also how they might relate to impact assessment. So please uh, go ahead and send in your answer, which, which are most exciting for you, data visualization, remote sensing, is it blockchain, or is it artificial intelligence? We'll give you three more seconds to vote, and then we'll close it three, two, one. All right. So we'll go ahead and share those results. So Marla. Well, that's interesting. I'm, I'm not surprised. I think data visualization is the most exciting one in some ways. And I think it, it's one of the easiest things for us to picture what we're going to do with it in the immediate future. And artificial intelligence has a lot of applications. Blockchain is this technology that keeps being brought up again and again. But it, it sounds like um, the people on this webinar, like myself, are having a harder time visualizing how it could be used. So I find that really interesting. And that just leads us to the questions part of, of the this. I have no more information to provide. Um, but we can see what it is that people are interested in. And so feel free to pose your questions, which Bridget can read out. Or you can just pose a comment that you want to get read um, if you just have something that you want, want to add to this conversation. So, Bridget, I don't know if we have millions of questions pouring in already, or uh, we do or have you questions. Just get to chat. <laughs> All right. So we'll start off with a question from Ronald, and he is. Uh, we actually have a few questions asking you if you have examples, um, and so you may or may not. But the first mm -hmm. question is if you have an example of how AI might be used for scoping or baseline data assembly in impact assessment. Um, I don't have any, if the question is, do I have any examples of who has used it and where? I don't personally, but I know that there's a couple of um, practitioners around the world who, who are, have been getting into this. One of them is Yuri Dusik, um, who, who I know approached me a couple of days ago. I can't remember where he's based. Bridget, do you? Uh, he's originally Czech, but he's right now working out of Vietnam. That's good. And I know that there's a group in Golder, I think based out of Turin in Italy, who are, are working on this as well. So they, may, they themselves may have examples. I don't know where it's been used, but I'm, I'd be really curious if, if anybody out there does have this information, if and when you write into the, the email address, let me know what's been done that you've seen and we can, we can start compiling those use cases and sharing them with the group. So someone else was asking about using AI in effectively in the assessment phase. Any examples of that either? Uh, it's it's going to go back to if there's examples, I don't have any. Um, all I have is is really more the theory of where it's been done. I've been 
taking a look at how it's being used in other professions and, and particularly in law because I find that there's there's many ways in which it's an analogy to what we're doing in that w when there's a, a legal case that is to be compiled and, and again my apologies in that I'm not a lawyer and so my terminology is going to be all wrong in this but they basically like us have to look through masses and masses of information and assemble things that are relevant and where there's precedent and say how it applies to the case that they're working on specifically. And so that's very much analogous to what we're doing, even though the types of information is itself different. And they've very successfully applied artificial intelligence to that process. Um, I've, I've taken a look at some of the results. Um, it, it, and there's a lot of small companies that have sprung up to provide this service in the legal profession. And, and what I've seen is that some of the results are pretty messy and all it does is it takes a report and it grabs the three most relevant pages and dumps it in here or grabs a little bit more information and dumps it in there. And so you, you instead of having to look through, say, five or 10,000 pages, you could just look through the, the most relevant 100 pages and, and decide what of that you want to use. Um, and then there's other things that, that actually go through that are more sophisticated and try to actually synthesize the information a bit itself. So um, if there starts to be a large demand in impact assessment, I suspect that there's going to be a lot of companies that spring up to try to take care of that need for us and fill that role in parallel with or maybe instead of companies having to develop this in-house. All right. Um, Victor has a comment uh, that Great. blockchain is now used in the mining sector, uh, conflict minerals, gold, and 3T, and mm. is now in the pilot stage in the DRC and other places. So I wanted to pass that, that along. I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that. I would imagine, Victor, that, that it's then used to ensure that, that conflict-free diamonds are, that, that there's a sort of a chain to, to ensure all the way along um, that you know um, its status and that, that it's not able to be falsified and, and then conflict passed off as not conflict. Um, so that, that's a really interesting one to know. Thank you. Uh, question. Uh, what about the evaluation of significance of impacts or effects? Are effects actually impacts of a project? So this is getting a bit outside um, the discussion of emerging technologies as I understand it. Um, I, I think where it ties in though is it comes back to that question of values um, and human values and how we decide things. The concept of significance is really interesting to me. There was a really good paper by um, Bill Ross and Alan Ehrlich about three years ago that was in the impact assessment and project, I, the IAPA journal that we all have access to as members. And they were talking about the concept of significance and saying, if you consider all effects along some sort of a continuum, and at one end you have no effect, and at the other end you have catastrophic effect, someplace you have to draw a line and say, this is where it's significant. It's a little bit too close to catastrophic and it's sufficiently far from no effect. But where that line is, where we say it's significant, is a, it, it's a human values question. And there's no easy way of coming at that. We can draw matrices and say, okay, if it's high in, in likelihood and if it's high in magnitude and if it's medium in this, then it's significant. And if it's not, then it's not significant. But that's a very artificial way of approaching it. Fundamentally, somebody has to make the decision that something is important enough to be significant. Um, and that information may come from a community who, who are the ones who ultimately are going to bear the burden of the impacts. And they're the ones who have to decide what's acceptable or not. It could be the regulator. Often it's devolved to us as IA practitioners. And we wind up making that judgment call about where the significance line lies on behalf of the community. Artificial intelligence is never going to be able to replace the process of deciding what appropriately constitutes a significant effect. How important is important enough that something becomes significant? If we can identify that as humans, then emerging technologies or artificial intelligence can help us identify what side of a line it lies on, but where to place that line of significance is a, a really, it's a fundamentally human activity. Marla, you had mentioned the paper by Bill Ross and Ellen Ehrlich. Uh, mm -hmm. Hugo's asking, to your knowledge, are there any academic forays into AI-assisted assessment? Not that I've seen. 
not that I've seen. However, I got a really interesting um, email yesterday from some folks at the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, who are working exactly on this. They didn't know about this webinar, um, so I think they're they're trying to get something started. So uh, the IFC has done wonderful work in certain other areas. So where they lead, perhaps others will follow. So Phil's wondering what you think will drive understanding of and innovation for the use of blockchain and impact assessment. And are there any industries or examples we should look to so that we can understand what is quite an abstract concept for most of us? It is, and, and it, it gets hard to um, understand also because it's so tied in with the concept of cryptocurrencies that you hear blockchain and, and Bitcoin often in the same sentence almost always, but it's really not the only application. Um, certainly the, the mining example that was brought up by Victor, the, um, the food chain example um, that was put in a comment by one of the people who registered from, for this webinar are, are two of the examples, two of the only examples that I've heard um, that have been raised that I think are applicable to impact assessment. Um, but because it's essentially a self-executing contract that, that it it executes itself when the conditions have been met correctly. I think that, uh, you know, as I said earlier in the webinar, that something like an impact benefit agreement um, may be a, a situation in which it could be applied. I, I'm still really thinking through this one. I, I'm not quite sure how the benefits of a self-executing uh, contract are, are really um, helpful here. I, I do understand that there's other aspects of blockchain, such as the fact that it's a distributed ledger that can't be falsified, that may also um, provide value to some people. But I, I personally, that's the one I'm really struggling with to figure out how. In terms of what's going to drive it, I, I think um, when we start to see its applications in other fields and we realize the anal analogies that we have for impact assessment, that's when we'll start taking it up. And, and really using it to the best of, of um, what we can do with it. Okay, we have time for one last question. Unfortunately, we won't get to them all, everybody, but thank you so much for posting your thoughts and comments and questions. And I will be passing those along to Marla too, so she can see all of those great comments. Um, so Fran is saying that one of the key aspects of impact assessment is the communication of the results to the appropriate mm -hmm. audience at an appropriate level of detail. So how do these technologies help with engagement and decision making and the influence of local political drivers? Any thoughts on that? What a great question. Um, I, I think it, I'm 100% on board with, with uh, where this question is going. I, I think it's there's been this bit of a, a chicken and egg situation where impact assessments have been put out and then people point to holes in where um, there's a lack of understanding and then we try to address that and we address it proactively the next time. And so it, impact assessments have grown from, from 50 pages to 20,000 pages. And that's just not possible for any one human to really wrap their mind around. So we, we need a different paradigm rather than just more reports, more reports, more reports. We know that humans are really great at understanding patterns and information that is presented in um, a variety of ways that we can really see our, our our brains are inherently visual. So the more that we're able to move towards media where we can uh, present things in a way that people can grasp outside of having to sit there and read on a line by line basis what our conclusions are, it, it will en enhance the ability of people to take in information. So all the things that are being developed now, like virtual rea reality, I've, I've seen some examples. Again, this goes back to Golder's group working in Turin where you can put on a virtual reality headset and put yourself into um, a, a particular physical environment and turn around and look to see how the visual landscape, for example, may change. That's not something you're ever going to be able to do to understand some social impacts, for example. You, you wouldn't want to be able to put on a virtual reality headset and see an increase in domestic violence. That would be a terrible thing. Um, but, the, but there are technologies that, that we're going to be able to harness, at least in certain ways, for, for conveying this information. So I, I think that, again, data visualization is one aspect of this. I'm not quite sure how we can use the other parts of emerging technology to, technologies to reduce information burden as opposed to merely increase it. Um, but it's something I'm, I'm very curious to see what happens in the future. 
Excellent. Well, thank you, Marla, for a great presentation. Thank you to all the participants for being here today and for posing such great questions. Mm -hmm. Marla, if you want to flip ahead to that last slide, which has the uh, new uh, new group for emerging technologies. I also posted that email address in the chat and so sent that out to you all that way as well. So you can just copy and paste. So uh, we really do appreciate you all uh, being here today. Uh, just a couple quick reminders as you depart that when you leave, you will be receive a link to a very quick exit survey. So we really appreciate your feedback um, and hope that you will take a few moments to, to answer those quick questions. In a few days, a day or two at the most, you'll also receive a link to the recording as well as the slides as a PDF handout. So, and we hope you all uh, consider joining this new group. We're excited to see where it might go. Um, it's like the technology is also emerging. We're not really sure the direction <laughs> it's going to be taking. <laughs> and Bridget, before you go, can I jump in with one more thing? Absolutely. Which is anybody who's on this webinar and is not already a member of IAIA, I have to put my board of directors hat on and say there is great value to be had in all kinds of things that IAIA does. I highly, highly encourage you to join. Um, membership is not that expensive and there's a lot of value to be gained. Absolutely. Thank you. And our website is IAIA.org. So you'll find all sorts of publications, resources, webinars, uh, and information about upcoming events and conferences as well. So something coming to you either virtually or in live in person. So, all right. Well, thank you all again for your time. We know that your time is valuable and we hope this was valuable to you as well. See you next time.